So these are the objectives for today, two lectures. Uh, it's quite heavy stuff because it's uh, learning about some diseases. But uh, I asked you to participate once in a while and I'm going to ask you questions about how these diseases are related to your work as engineers in the field. Um, so we're going to cover first some of the linkages between human health and environmental health to give us a kind of a background on it. And then we're going into some of the specific diseases uh, in the second half. So we, if you look up environmental health in the WHO, uh, they, they have actually whole reports about different definitions of environmental health. Uh, there's no uh, consensus how to define environmental health. It can be defined narrowly or very broadly to encompass almost everything in our world if we define everything as the environment. But these are some of the, the factors, the physical, chemical, biological, social, and psychosocial factors in the environment that are uh, usually included in definitions of environmental health. Uh, but if you read the second paragraph, it also refers to the theory and practice of assessing, correcting, controlling, and preventing factors. So it's a lot about how humans behave and act in the environment as well. So it's not something that is uh, devoid of uh, human touch, environmental health. It's a lot about how humans act and inter interact with the environment, and how they may create hazards, and how they control and prevent hazards. OK? So it has a, a physical, chemical side, and it has a human behavioral side. Yeah? Uh, I was actually shocked when I started to read the, the, these reports again to see how high these numbers are. So 24% of the disease burden in the world is caused by environmental factors. It's a quarter of all disease in the world that is caused by environmental factors. That's a very, very, very big number. And lots of that disease burden can be prevented. 23% um, of all deaths are caused by modifiable environmental factors. 23% of all deaths, that's an enormous number that we here in this group as uh, environmental engineers can actually help to prevent by controlling factors in the environment. Modifiable environmental factors. So it means everything that we can actually change. So when WHO is creating these uh, estimates, they're only estimating what we can actually change and control. So they're not measuring, for example, um, if there's a natural uh, there's a landscape and there are some natural hazard in the landscape that we cannot change. For example, uh, tall trees. We're not going to cut down the trees or change a river or something. They're not estimating that. So they're estimating the factors, the risks from factors that can be modified with simpler or more advanced changes of the environment. Okay, so let's have a look at the world or uh, at the the environmental factors that uh, WHO they integrate into their measures. Uh, pollution of air, water, soil, with chemicals, or biological agents. So some of you have already mentioned sanitation issues, but there are also air pollution, right? And it's rising rapidly in some parts of the world. Uh, water pollution, some of you also mentioned that. Uh, UV, uh, noise, occupational risks, uh, risks uh, uh, related to uh, the built environment, so infrastructures, uh, housing, lands, roads, right? road, road uh, uh, accidents, uh, traffic, injuries on roads, it's a big, big, big group of the environmental diseases, especially rising in low and middle income countries as the traffic is, uh, is growing. Yeah? Agricultural methods, irrigation schemes, lots of, uh, lots of disease attached to that, we'll come back to that. 
uh, climate change and ecosystem change. That, that's also one of your main themes, I, I guess. Is that right? Climate issues, ecosystem issues. Lots of disease uh, attached to this field as we change our ecosystem in different ways uh, with the businesses or agricultural practices that are changed, risks can arise. And behavior related to sanitation and water, which you mentioned, like washing hands, contaminated foods, like you mentioned, unsafe water and unclean hands. So here is the world, and the darker the areas, the more disease is concentrated. Uh, so Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and the rest of Africa, and uh, Asia are the, the high-risk areas, but with, like you said, with risk spots in urban poor, poor uh, settings. Yeah, where people are crowded, have poor water and sanitation, and so on. But Western Africa is much more dry, much, much, much more dry. So the water supply uh, is, is poorer, uh, and that, that gives a lot of, of diseases. Uh, North Africa, I know that the food safety issues, uh, agricultural issues, are big. There are lots of occupational risks and lots of uh, disease attached to food, poor food safety. So this, these are the hotspots for, for poor environmental health. If we look at uh, water, sanitation and hygiene, which is uh, a big deal for you, isolated, and we don't look at all the chemical stuff and occupational health and traffic and all that, uh, this is how disease is, uh, is uh, divided, you could say. Uh, diarrheal diseases. 39% of all diseases related to water sanitation hygiene are uh, diarrheal diseases. Not so surprising, like uh, drowning, 6%. Uh, in Asia, uh, drowning is a is a major problem for small children uh, because there's so much uh, irrigation schemes uh, and uh, dams and uh, and uh, so man-made water bodies. And that creates extra risk for, for children running around, or if there's, <coughs> in India, they still have a lot of wells that are not covered, so some children fall into them. Surprisingly, isn't it? But it's actually a major environmental problem. Malnutrition, and uh, so this is only protein energy malnutrition, but this is uh, all malnutrition. Very, very big, and we'll see later, it's very connected to the issue of diarrheal diseases, these two. And together they are really the major, major issue for, for water sensation and hygiene related diseases. 9% of all deaths could be prevented if we could prevent these things. All this is, is practically uh, preventable. So 23% of all deaths, all environmental diseases, but wash alone 9% of all deaths in the world. So it's, it's staggering numbers, right? It's really many people each year that die from preventable issues that we could solve with a few tools from your, from your program. Diarrhea, uh, this is how it, it's... Uh, it's distributed in the world, so this world map looks strange because the countries have a size that corresponds to the number of diseases that are in the country. So you see India has grown out of proportion, uh, and so has uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and Western Africa. Uh, so this, this is still where these children die, and uh, sadly, uh, this has not changed so much. Uh, fewer... Uh, uh, Oh, and I think, can't remember, but a lot of children get diarrhea each year, and 1.5 million people die uh, each year from diarrhea still, and that has been still standing for some time. One, approximately 1 million a year children die from diarrhea. Um, it's, it's actually a little bit curious because we have managed to improve treatment enormously. So today we can give ORS, do you know what that is? So oral rehydration salt solutions, so it's uh, liquids with salts and minerals in, 
that can stop the diarrhea or stop the dehydration and then eventually stop the diarrhea. We can give zinc supplementation to children, which increases the absorption of uh, nutrients and lipids in the intestines. Uh, and and uh, all doctors and nurses or any, any health personnel know in the world that it's, you have to act urgently if a small child has diarrhea, because a small child can die within days of diarrhea. But despite all this, children still die uh, and still get lots and lots and lots of diarrhea. So in addition to, to treatment and being a good uh, health staff, we need environmental engineers to change, to control issues in the environment and to, to do what we can to prevent these cases from arising. So these are the areas of intervention, if we think about environmental health. These are the things that you <coughs> probably will be doing something in your future. <coughs> and these are the things that <coughs> evidence shows that this can prevent diseases. But if we look at uh, where these intervention areas belong, you see that they're really spread across many different administrative sectors and different planning offices and so on. Actually, in Denmark, yes, we force people to have a toilet. It's mandatory if you have a household that you have a waste management system. Uh, so some kind of toilet you have to have, and you have to have, and you have to have some kind of waste management system. And if you don't have a sewer that connects to the national uh, sewage system, you have to prove that it's a safe system. For example, a, sept a septic tank on your own ground. Some people have that still in Denmark. So some degree it's the commune, some degree it's the private households. Yeah? And some parts of the sewage system, for example, the big, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, sewage uh, plants, they are national. They are not communal, because that would cost so much money for this, a single commune to, have a, to, to, to run a big sewage plant. Yeah? Actually, in many, many low- and middle-income countries, there are no national waste collection systems so a lot of that uh, depends much more or, or relies much more on households to clean their own areas. So in Vietnam, for example, where I did my PhD, there are programs where, they are, where people are taught in the communities to keep their own areas clean. So that's a responsibility for the household. You can be fined if you don't clear the gutters or cut the grass or collect your waste or burn plastic. Uh, but here in Denmark, it's a different situation. Sometimes I think it's more dirty here in the streets in Denmark than in Vietnam. Because in Denmark, we all rely on the governmental system to clean up the streets. Right? Uh, the other areas, uh, the point here is that if you look at any country, uh, environmental health intervention areas will be spread across many sectors. And it demands that sectors are cooperating. Right? And sometimes interventions fail because they fall in between chairs. Uh, because one sector thinks that it's the other sector. Health Ministry of Health thinks that they are not responsible for educating children, that must be the Ministry of Education. And Ministry of Education, they say, we can't handle health issues because that has to be medical people that do that. Then who does it, right? So a lot of these intervention areas, when you are going out in the future as environmental engineers, you might have to get hold of the local uh, school teacher or headmaster and the head nurse and the nutritional uh, doctor and the occupational, the road injury guy, and stuff, and make them cooperate, right? So that's, that's the whole point. Sometimes we have forgotten uh, where the risk, risks are, because we have big systems to take care of them. We have central sewage systems, central drainage systems, central solid waste management systems. All that is taken care of by some invisible system, right, that we don't have much knowledge about. So we kind of forget sometimes that if we don't flush the toilet, it can bring disease and so on. And in, in countries or in settings where you don't have the central systems, maybe these hazards are more, they're closer to you. You're more aware of the hazards. Yeah. Mm -hmm.